record this to the cloud. All right, and so I'm Wayne Wakeland. I, I'm a, a professor of system science at Portland State University, and I run a little system science program that has graduate and undergraduate curriculum associated with it. Um, and uh, let's see, go ahead, Naveed, with the next, in the next person. Jim? Let's see, is that Jim? Wow. Maybe I'm, is that John or? Uh, sorry, I, I can't. It looks like John, but it says yeah, yeah, no, it's John. John. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Why does it sorry. Say Jim? Yes, <laughs> I'm How using you some your name and you move to America, right? So, yes, I think I'm using a, a computer belonging to Jim. That is why. <laughs> so, hi, my name is John. Uh, I used to be at Duke in Singapore. I just moved to Cleveland uh, three days ago. So, I'm, I'm calling from Cleveland. <laughs> Great. Eric? Oh, hi, I'm Eric Wollstenholm. I'm, I'm based in the UK and uh, a long-standing contributor to system dynamics modeling in health and a long-standing collaborator of uh, Douglas at Symmetric Scenarios. Shreya? Hello, I'm Shreya. I'm a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. I'm looking to apply system dynamics to mental health. Very good. David? Hello, folks. Um, I'm, I'm David Monk and uh, a colleague of Douglas and Eric and um, partly responsible for commissioning the piece of work that led Douglas into the state that he's in now, <laughs> the bit that he's going to show today. And, and have been involved with Douglas and Eric actually for many years, modelling, uh, um, well, I'm not a modeller, but, but dealing with systems thinking around mental health services. So a long, a long history of working in mental health services and with Douglas and Eric's help trying to understand some of the issues we've faced in there. So pleased Great to be here today. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ross? Hi, everyone. My name is Ross Williams. I'm a second semester PhD student at Virginia Tech under Dr. Jose Nichime. Nice to meet everyone. Great to have you, Ross. Ashish? Hi, I'm Ashish Kumar. I'm in Singapore. Uh, I work in the health systems design lab at uh, Duke uh, in US Medical School. Nice to be here. Jack. Hi folks, Jack Homer uh, here in the Hudson Valley of New York. I'm an independent consultant. I've worked for a long time in, with system dynamics applications to health. Nice to be here. Edward. Uh, hi everybody, I'm Edward. Uh, I'm located in Oslo, Norway. I'm completing my PhD uh, in the University of Bergen in system dynamics, submitting hopefully next week. Um, and um, I'm working in Oslo in a public health and nutrition group on a project uh, dealing with overweight obesity among adolescents. In fact, Jack is my mentor in that project. Um, so we've been working with him since last summer. Great to have you in this group. Thank you. Uh, Sandra? Uh, hi, everyone. I'm a third year or fourth year now PhD student at the University of Bern in Switzerland. I'm using system dynamics modeling for socio ecological systems, and I'm supervised by Birgit Kopinski from the University of Bergen. Thanks. Great. Glad to have you here. Hassan? If you're hearing us, Hassan. <laughs> Probably he's not uh, close to his microphone. Let's move to um, our presenter today, Douglas. If you just give us a line of introduction and then you can start your presentation. Oh, Hassam is online. Hassam, you want to introduce yourself? I'm sure. Sorry, my, my audio system was sort of crashing mid mid. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Hassam and I'm a PhD student at Virginia Tech. Um, it's good to be back in these meetings. Great. Uh, Douglas, floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, hello. I, I'll, maybe I'll start by putting a PowerPoint slide up then. Shh, just uh, why not? Uh, just a second. I um, share my screen, I think. <laughs> I've spent too much time on Teams recently and now I'm back in Zoom. So uh, if, I, if I slip up, you'll know what's happened. How's that? Very good. Okay, right. Uh, so I, uh, nice to see uh, everybody. Uh, many of you I know, which makes this a bit more terrifying. Um, so 
uh, presentations led by myself, uh, Douglas from uh, Symmetric in the United Kingdom. So I, I live in Scotland and work across the UK, mostly in England, as it happens, and the project that we're going to describe took place in, in London. Um, before I do that, though, I think there's a couple of people who have not introduced themselves who've just arrived. I see Petra and there's uh, John. So um, maybe Petra and John could introduce themselves and then we'll, uh, that, you've just missed the introductions. So um, that's all. Sorry, sorry about this. This is the people who warned three times to use the right link and still managed to hang out in the wrong Zoom room. Um, <laughs> you can tell something about the intelligence of the audience there. <laughs> um, Petra Meyer, I'm a professor of public health at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And Gary, could you introduce yourself because you've just dropped into the room, everybody else, had, so you'll have to figure out who everybody else is, but then. I, I, I probably know most other people. I'm Gary Hirsch. I'm a uh, freelance uh, consultant and researcher, longtime system dynamicist. Okay, uh, and welcome. So, um, yes, so basically, um, uh, I have a background in social work, but I have been working in health and social care modeling for about 20 years, um, having, having learned almost everything uh, from, from uh, Eric Wilson home, who is, who is no stranger and who is part of the, uh, the presentation. Um, David Monk, uh, who, who some of you have met for the first time, uh, we've, we've worked with David on, on and off quite intensively over the years. And, and David's current role uh, and his relationship to this project is as a strategy advisor in the South London Partnership, which is a, <clears throat> a partnership that runs national health service, mental health services for South London, which has a population, I think, of about 3 million. Is that right, David? Yeah, a little bit more than that, but that's about right. A little bit yeah. more than that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, so a, a sizable chunk of, of London. We may be joined in the course of, of the session by Eva Zadi, who, who among other things is uh, a consultant psychiatrist with a very busy schedule. So if, if Eva can drop in, then she will try to do that. Um, and, I, and I hope she does. Uh, so uh, that, that's the team. <clears throat> We're, so what we're describing here is a model of the prevalence of anorexia nervosa. Um, I can see just about everybody's face. So could you put your, could you raise your, your physical hand uh, or your Zoom hand, I suppose, if you prefer, if you have done any modeling of anorexia nervosa? Jack, I know Jack, uh, yeah, so but, um, right, so that's, so, so the references that I've got in my presentation are complete because I've got Jack's one, um, but it, 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 it is a field that uh, has, has not, not really been on the system dynamics radar before, um, and so it's, it's interesting uh, to have uh, Shreya in the meeting who is, is specifically looking at um, mental health services. So, um, so anorexia and there was as part of that. And so in, in keeping with what we've been doing in the SIG, this is, this is not so much work in progress as, as work that, that did progress and some, and a, and a kind of sketch model that we built on the side of a, a model that we did while we were looking at capacity planning. So, we had a project looking at capacity planning across the adult eating disorder pathway uh, in, uh, I've said southwest London, but really south, south London, um, which was really triggered by COVID compounded service backlogs. Uh, and and um, so there was a need to, to look at the capacity and flow across a range of services. But on the side of that project, there was a small subgroup of us, uh, in, but in, crucially including some service users, people with experience of anorexia nervosa, uh, and one or two of, uh, of their family members. Uh, and I was, I was intrigued because 
in, in this project, um, which one of the partners of the project is a, a major teaching hospital in London that's kind of a world authority on, on mental health. Um, and it seemed to me that if I was working with a client with that level of expertise, I wouldn't be able to ask any questions I liked about prevalence and incidence, and, and I would be pointed in the right direction of, of, of data. But in fact, when it comes to looking at the, the prevalence uh, and incidence of anorexia, I, I think there's a, a great deal that's not known. And so we, we basically built a model that was not the client model. Um, and we think it has some mileage in it, but, but nobody's um, commissioned it. Uh, and so we're just kind of throwing it out, putting it out there to see if, if, if it generates any interest. And so with the, the critical friends that we have in the health SIG, it'd be interesting just to know what, what you think. Um, so I think that's a good use of the health SIG. Uh, another good use of the health SIG is to promote uh, the book that Eric and I wrote a couple of years ago, um, which obviously most of you will have read from cover to cover. Some of you here will even have provided its foreword. Um, and you can get more information there. But basically, um, in chapter two of the book, uh, we look at how very many of the models that we've we built in the health and social care sector over the years have been about balancing capacity across complex care pathways, a kind of supply chain sort of model with backlogs in it. But actually, in chapter four, we look more at what we call the shape of illness. And that really owes a great deal to the work of, of particularly people like, like Jack and Gary, uh, whose models are very focused on the dynamics of particular conditions. Um, and I, I think there's an interesting, uh, the, 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 there may be an interesting question about, about the difference between uh, countries where there are publicly run health systems that have to join together uh, and sometimes don't always join together in, in, in the best ways uh, compared with, with, with the American system where, where it makes more sense to look at specific conditions. And, and we've learned a great deal from that, that kind of model. And I think we would like people in the, in the UK working under our systems to, to think a bit more about the, about the shape of conditions. I'm gonna say a bit more about that. Um, but over the years, we've had more demand for the capacity type of model. So, would you give me a minute to move my screen around? Uh, and I'm just going to, most of what I'm going to show you just now will be in Stella, you'll be delighted to know. Um, so, I'm just going to get Stella up and running. Okay, has my screen survived that transition? Nobody's telling me. <laughs> yes. Yes, that Great. is. Oh, okay. So what I mean by capacity and flow type of structure is where you've got, say, a, a hospital with a waiting list, with people going in, getting treated, and then being discharged. And the main flow looks a bit like that. People go in and people come out again. But some people need something else. They need care from some other part of the system. And so we have, if you like, a social care sector, and it has a capacity. And what you end up with is bottlenecks uh, at, at various points along, along this chain. And this is a very simplistic view of that model, but that, that's the kind of model uh, that, that we often build. Uh, and this is actually the model that, that we built when we looked at the adult eating disorder pathway in, in, in South London. Uh, and although I'm not going, we're not going to be running this model um, for you, give you a sense of it, that it's got the same kind of structure, that it's got various levels of service. People come in, go through outpatients, and many are discharged as outpatients. Some go on to require inpatient treatment or to be day patients, which is attending a hospital during the day, but not, but not occupying a bed. And there are different types of patients so that there are referrals from local patients and because this is a, a specialised service, it takes referrals from across the whole country, uh, country being England in, in, in this case. Uh, and, and they are referred only for, the, for its inpatient services. 
Um, and there are, there are various financial implications of this, because depending on how well this system manages its local population, and bearing in mind that you've got some leading clinicians here who uh, are pioneering quite innovative treatments, it may well be that they succeed in keeping more of their local population out of the inpatient beds, of which there are very few. And that means that the regional and national patients can, can use, the, use these inpatient beds. That has implications for um, cash flow because there is some income generated from having patients from further afield. Um, and, and also, but there's also the more important dynamic that in pioneering innovative treatments um, and making less use of inpatient beds locally, they, they also have to disseminate good practice across the nation. And that will mean that in time, the referrals from other regions will will go down and the occupancy here might go down as well so so basically there were some tricky calculations you see there's a finance sector down here about how to how to, how to plan strategically when the consequences of various decisions about capacity and type of treatment would have consequences for uh, how many beds would be occupied by local patients and, and national patients so that, that was what that model was about and it's pretty obvious within the terms of a short term piece of work that that's enough of a model to be to be building. And yet uh, there was this question about prevalence. Who, who is this for? Um, so that's the that's the pathway. That's the pathway model. What we mean by prevalence to put it really simply in stock flow terms for anyone who hasn't thought about it is, is that prevalence is a stock. It's the number of people at any given time who have got a condition and it's fed by incidence and it's drained by recovery and sometimes also by mortality. So that's, that's the logic here is the logic of the condition, not the logic of the service. Um, we've become uh, is familiar with the SIR type of model where we've got a, a model of the whole population uh, in relation to an infectious uh, disease and actually we've, we've seen more elaborate versions of this model in recent days with COVID so that, that's, a, that's a rough description of, of a COVID kind of a model where you've got a susceptible population who become exposed uh, and, and move into being infected. Um, there is some mortality there is a great deal of recovery. Um, and uh, among the measures that, that are possible would be that people are vaccinated. Uh, and that might be people from the susceptible population or people from the recovered population. Uh, and then gradually people lose their immunity and move back towards becoming susceptible again. So, so we're all kind of familiar with an infectious disease kind of shape. So each of these conditions has its own shape. In system dynamics, We've, we've more often been modeling long-term conditions, um, starting probably in the United States with diabetes. Uh, in the United Kingdom, probably been more concerned with, um, with dementia. But the typical structure of such a model is that a long-term condition is degenerative. It goes only in one direction. So there is incidence, and then there is progression from left to right. And it looks something like this. Uh, often described in terms of mild, moderate, and severe. Um, also with mortality. So people with a mild state of this condition might, might die from some other condition. Uh, so there's mortality at all points. And the, the challenge in this kind of model is managing, uh, helping people to manage their conditions. In, in order to do that, we need to diagnose the condition and that would affect the, the way in which people move from, from left to right, particularly it would affect the mortality rate. So although in, in, in dementia, there's not a great deal you can do about the uh, um, brain degeneration, people move in, in the left to right direction, uh, probably the mortality rates of people who have been diagnosed and are being treated, their mortality rate from other conditions goes down. So, so that again is a structure that will be familiar. Um, and something that makes it 
quite modelable uh, is the fact that the flow is always in the direction of left to right. Um, so you don't get people trapped inside the model going round in circles, if you like. When it comes to mental health, I should, I should have said earlier, by the way, um, if, you, if you want to ask a question, the best way to do that is actually just to interrupt me. Uh, but you could try putting your Zoom hand up, and I take it that somebody like Wayne uh, or will be looking out for what's happening in the room. So I, I don't have an eye on what's happening in, in, in the room, but please feel free to, to interrupt at any point. When it comes to mental health, um, then this, the shape of the, the condition is, is a bit more complicated. Uh, so this is a uh, an outline of what um, psychosis might look like in system dynamic terms. Uh, it begins with a first episode and a stock of people who are, are experiencing an early acute episode. Um, hopefully people recover from that, but they go into a stock of people who have, have now got a history of having had an early episode and they may return to have further further episodes or they may exit that system and, and the, the term for that is that prodromal so that's the diagnosis is that they had a prodromal version of of the condition and, the, and it hasn't converted into a, a full psychosis um, and and there's there's a lot of discussion about early intervention and about the the, the opportunity that happens here uh, which if missed can lead to people going on to having a chronic psychosis and here there, there might be various levels and there might be a mild moderate and severe stock stock flow structure inside that for example with periodic acute episodes and then a return to a chronic condition and for some people there might be a, uh, a possibility of what you would call recovery but people still having a history of of mental uh, ill health and then returning for, for uh, another acute episode. And the, the, the typical name for this would be remitting and relapsing rather than degenerative. So in modeling terms, you've got more of a kind of circular movement around the system. Uh, does anyone want to ask anything at this point before I go on to anorexia? So that's, that's the shape of, of uh, some mental ill health. So that, that was kind of the baggage that I took to the anorexia um, problem. And I should say anorexia nervosa is only one eating disorder, but it's it, it, uh, it, although it's not the largest population of, of, of all eating disorders, it is uh, particularly, uh, I think of all um, men mental illnesses, it has the highest mortality rate, certainly among younger people. So in anorexia nervosa, uh, severity of, so it's, they adopt the same nomenclature of mild, moderate, severe, they, to which they add extreme. Uh, and these categories are measured in terms of body mass index. So in, in the first one, getting below 17.5 BMI, moderate being in the 16s, severe being in the 15s and extreme being less than 15 BMI. And so incidence in the, these terms is always to the mild state because you would have to go through that, that BMI in order to get to the lower BMIs. And so the, the movement is in that direction, but it's also, I, I should say here, the mortality from extreme is, is the highest mortality rate of any mental disorder. And Hopefully there is movement in that direction so that people don't reach the extreme stage. And there is also recovery uh, and people who have a history of having had anorexia but are not currently suffering from it. And sadly, quite a relapsing rate. And, and I think a, um, a fairly typical, if that's not a bad word to use, uh, example would, would be uh, there's a very high percentage of people with anorexia who are who are female, typically becoming ill in teens to late teens to early twenties, and possibly 
recovering and relapsing various times in, 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 in their adult life with the, with the relapse rate becoming less uh, as they get older, assuming that they have survived the, the condition. So, <clears throat> so that is one view of, of the severity of anorexia nervosa, nervosa measured in terms of body mass index. But people with anorexia nervosa say it's not all about BMI, it's actually about mental well-being. Uh, and some of the, um, uh, the service users we, we met in this project would, would, would interpret the message that they're given as being you're not yet ill enough to get treatment. And it's almost like they, they, they have to move in this direction in order to, to be noticed in order to get treatment. And so well-being looks a bit like this. So you've got incidents, um, which I had to misspell because of uh, an early recurrence of the word incidents in this diagram. Um, and people are either, in terms of their mental well-being, deteriorating, they're, 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 they're getting worse. Uh, or perhaps they're in this state which was described to us as being stuck, so neither going in one direction nor another for a while, or recovering. And it can work both ways. So in terms of your mental well-being, when you're first unwell, clearly deteriorating, having gone from being uh, crossing the threshold in, in, into having the condition, and then there's a, a, a possibility of improvement. Uh, and so there's movement like that. So if you put these phenomena together, then we end up with a matrix where the, the horizontal part is to do with changes in BMI and the vertical part is to do with mental well-being. So we've got people moving from mild to moderate, to severe, extreme and back again. And then in, in terms of mental well-being, deteriorating, stuff and improving. And therefore the stock and flow structure looks a bit like this. So there's incidence, uh, mild, moderate, severe, extreme, going in that direction and, and mortality, sadly. But some people at the mild end be become stuck, which is a good thing. That means they're no longer going in that direction. And then that, that might resolve itself into moving towards improving and indeed recovering, or it might result in going back to deteriorating again. So there's the possibility of, uh, at, even at the mild state, improving mental health and then deteriorating mental health or, or recovery. And if you extend that diagram outwards, you then get this shape. And notice that in the middle level of stuck, you're not moving left or right, your, your BMI is not changing. Um, and so that's my kind of rough, uh, oh, just to complete the picture, there's also the possibility of relapsing. Um, so basically we've got a mild, moderate, severe and extreme state in terms of BMI. We've got mental well-being in terms of improving, being stuck and deteriorating. Then we've got people who are recovered and sadly a, pa a pattern of, of people relapsing and going back into here. Um, Everybody still with me in terms of the shape of this diagram and any questions? Uh, Douglas, well, I, it's just this term stuck that I'm stuck on. Okay. Uh, right. mm -hmm. so, so should I interpret that as stabilized in some way? Would you that could, be another term? You could, you could interpret it as stabilized. However, if, if you're stabilized at a very low BMI, that's not a good place to be. So, so when we were thinking more about the extreme end and, and, and people in hospital, then they described to us that we've got a number of people in the ward and they're not getting any worse, but we can't get them to get any better. 
and and they can spend a long time stuck on a particular level of i mean it's a bit like I, I suppose gaining and losing weight is a process that takes time and quite often in our lives we're neither gaining nor losing but staying the same um so I, an earlier version of this model jack I, well I, the options you have when you're drawing a structure like this would be just to say let's have mild moderate severe and extreme and let's have flows going in both directions and people are either going to the right or to the left um my second pass at it was was to have the deteriorating and improving but without the middle row so that you've got people who are either going in the deteriorating direction or the um improving direction but that didn't quite capture the this, this phenomenon of, of people who are, are not actually going in either direction if you see what i mean um don't know if that answers your question jack or whether you're now unstuck no that's good i i just um <laughs> Of course, the more stocks you have, yeah. uh, the more the trickier it is to to categorize people and and count Indeed. them. Exactly that. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Douglas, it might might be worth saying to Jack actually that the, the phrase "getting stuck" was one that came from our service users as well, and our carers would describe the sense of being stuck wherever they would be in the terms of the capacity of the system to try and treat. They'd, they'd often use that phrase themselves. I think that's right, isn't it, Douglas? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. they would. Yeah. And I'd just like to piggyback on what Jack said that I look at this and think, oh my God, where are we ever going to get the data to inform all this so that we can have more than just a conceptual model? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, and, well, Wayne, that's kind of what I was going to ask you for. Um, so, uh, so that was the kind of examples of model structure, and I'm, and I'm going to, so as I discovered with my quick poll at the beginning of this meeting, there don't seem to be many SD models of anorexia nervosa. Jack did one in the 1980s, which was actually a model of the individual sufferer and the kind of feedback mechanisms within uh, a, a person in terms of their food uh, intake and activity and so on. So, so that's another way of thinking of, of how system dynamics can, could help would be to build a model of, of the actual person who, who, who's suffering from anorexia. But what we're looking at today is looking at the population level. And uh, to, an <laughs> to answer Wayne's question in, in negative, uh, there was in, 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 in the UK Parliament, there was a major report on this a few years ago. There's been an update to this since I did the project, but, but basically what, what they noted was that there's a lack of precise information on the prevalence of eating disorders that, that's shocking, given the claims that up to 1.25 million people out of a population of uh, England's probably around 55, 60 million now, I think. Uh, that, uh, that number of people suffering from eating disorders, not, not all of which are anorexia, and that they have the highest mortality rate. Uh, and this vagueness limits the ability of NHS commissioners, people like David, to gauge what services need to be provided, and also encourages them to devote resources to better recorded diseases and conditions. So yes, how, how might we get the, the data? So what I've done is, I've basically built a concept model of that structure, but I obviously don't have the data. Um, and, oh, sorry, I should go back to PowerPoint, actually. Um, if I can. Yeah, so. So basically, I'm, I'm going to show you a model very soon. Uh, and if you look at that URL there, you can see it's on the IC exchange, so you can actually play with it. Um, but apart from some estimates of the overall population point prevalence, we've no data about the dynamics of the condition, by which would mean the incidence, the time taken to progress between the different states and the fractions moving between the deteriorating stock and improving. Um, uh, and their relapse rates from the with history population. Um, but what we can do is explore how a model with this underlying stock flow structure can behave. If structure drives behavior, then what does a model like, what would a model look like? 
And we actually used uh, an earlier version of this model with people who have anorexia, who actually weren't able to engage with it and, and made comments like, as I've mentioned before, that they need to reach a certain low point before they merit being treated. And also the views of some clinicians who noted that admitting people uh, to treatment with a higher BMI led to shorter lengths of stay, which seems kind of obvious, but sometimes you need a model to help you with that. So, so here is the, um, let me take that one down. Just moving between models now, so bear with me. Ask another question as we do this. I, I have a question. Yeah, hello, yes. Yeah, so I, I apologize. I just joined. I had another meeting that ran mm -hmm. long. Um, but uh, decades ago, I did train as a clinical psychologist. So I, I do have that in my background. Um, and I'm just thinking about how moving um it might be harder the more severe you are yeah right so that um it's um if you've got if it's mild um your your thoughts um you might have more ambivalence there might be sort of like uh uh some positives that you could hook on to to help that that patient um, the behaviors aren't as habitual, perhaps, um, and that uh, they don't have as far to move. Um, and also just the absence of food makes it harder to think, right? So yeah. when you're sick, um, it's, it, it's hard to do this work. Mm. Yeah. Right? So I can imagine at least three different factors contributing to making it easier to become unstuck when you are mild versus when you're moderate versus severe versus very severe so that that those those relationships look different depending on where you are in the severity yeah and and actually I, i've just run the model now and so i'll, I'll explore a little of what you said so um so the movement from left to right is people's how, how many months it might take to move between these uh, levels of BMI downwards and upwards. That's, that's the, these inputs there in months. The movements up and down, I've just put on sliders. And, the, and, and so you were saying that, that people, if, if we could help people in the extreme case to move more in that direction, away from de deteriorating and towards improving then can you see that the, the dotted lines so you could, in this model the base run is the solid line and the dotted line is the impact of the work that we're doing at the very extreme end and obviously the impact on on the whole population is somewhat limited whereas as you might expect if it was possible to intervene more at the the early stages and move more people more people down at this point then that then becomes more of a journey for more people going that way and hopefully out again some of them might deteriorate and therefore the numbers reaching these stages would be less but obviously the numbers that you would have to identify and, and treat uh, would be uh, would be significant, and actually the the specialised clinicians tend to see people at, at this end of, of the spectrum. Um, Do you have to move through stuck to um, move yeah, from I, deteriorating to improving? Um, yes and no. So yes, you would, but it may be that your that, that that your period in in the stuck stop might actually be very short. So it, it is possible that people would go from deteriorating through stuck very quickly to to improving. Other other people might be stuck for quite a long time. So so it's not a conveyor belt. It's it, 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 it there is mixing in in that stock conceptually. Um, Douglas, I, I I do think in it's important to 
always go back to the clinical realities and, and opportunities. So, yeah. and, and reflecting back on where we began, which was an adult uh, service, uh, would it be useful then to, to break, I, I hate to multiply yeah. Yeah, no. stocks, but, but to at least distinguish between adult and juvenile here, understanding that there are, there are apparently different services for the two mm. uh, age, yeah. age groups. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I, what, what I, what I think uh, on that one, Jack, is that, is that probably that what, what you might do with, given the, the long-term nature of, of the condition would be actually to, to array that model where one level of the array would be the first episode, the next level would be the second and so on. And, and therefore the people in, in the first stage would be more likely to be in, in, in view. So that would be one way of doing it. But yes, uh, Segmenting it by age, uh, uh, while a terrifying prospect that makes a great deal of sense. And, you know, also, just also yeah. reflecting on the the fact that there's there's a fair amount of aging out, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. and, and so I would think that these flow rates would be quite different for adult than for juvenile. Yes, I, I, yes, I think I think I think that's I think that's right. And basically, I, I think Jack, that, that that's exactly the kind of conversation you would want to have with clinicians. But it's very hard actually to, to begin to have them, because the the challenge of um, investigating conditions like this in a, in a dynamic sense, in terms of actually having the data that would enable you to estimate what the transition rates are, uh, is is well, it, it's more than one could achieve in in what. This was probably a 40 day project. So, um, hence the, so I mean, another one would be to say, what, what about services for people who are recovered, providing more support to people who have a history? Could we reduce the, re the relapse rate? So, maybe move it down from 15% per annum to 12%, my estimate. That turns out to be quite powerful in fact because a, a lot of the people moving back in are, are people who are relapsing with, with a career of, of, of having the condition. Um, I love that idea. <laughs> I think that's, that's a great idea. Um, and I had a question like do do patients get categorized in their charts as mild, moderate, severe or extreme? Like is that something if you did a chart yeah. review, could you? track a patient through and and uh is their well-being uh charted as deteriorating stuck or improving i could be quite confident that their well-being probably wouldn't be categorized in that way but certainly the severity in terms of mild moderate severe and extreme would be um particularly as the clinicians that we were dealing with would say that they dealt mostly with people in the extreme and severe categories and um, David, uh, being a bit closer to the cold face, might be able to, to answer that question. So, so whether it's actually recorded for every person at every time, I don't know, David. Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I haven't gone and extensively looked at, say, a case note and, and reviewed it, but those are very um, kind of culturally appropriate terms that clinicians and colleagues use all the time mm -hmm. to describe the, the patients they're dealing with. Um, especially sort of you talk about the big mild or moderate or severe or, or extremely severe. You know, they may not use the word deteriorating as a sort of part of that, that makeup, but they use the, the moderate and mild pieces. And do they use that so. about the same patient as that patient is progressing? Or do they just use that as uh, this patient is in my clinic and coming in, they are moderate? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then it, it, and then that categorization doesn't change as the patient changes. It should change as the patient should change. Yeah. Oh, also, I agree. But yeah, does yeah. It, is that recorded in the chart? I, I should think it would be because what what they what they do regularly, I think probably at uh, for outpatients every appointment would be um, to, to, uh, to weigh people. So actually they will have a record of, the, although the mantra is that we have to get beyond focusing too much on BMI, I think that they would have very good records of what the BMI uh, of a person is. So I should, so therefore in terms of the known population, 
they could begin to estimate some of the, some of these data. How you would get at it for the unknown population um, is uh, something else. Um, but yes, so, if, sorry, Douglas. Just just on that that point. I mean, having had a a daughter that's gone through sort of services of this nature, the BMI beca almost becomes the the default measurement that's used by clinical colleagues to describe and enter into a conversation that might take you into one of those stocks, but it's very BMI driven, mm -hmm. um, very BMI driven, mm -hmm. lots of weighing, lots of scales, lot, you know, <laughs> it's not uh, much to the, uh, I, you know, the annoyance really of the population that are being treated here really. I wanted to ask if uh, Doug, how much more of your presentation, or do you want to be in uh, discussion where you don't have too much more time? And I, I want you to be able to yeah. stay in charge of your. Well, sorry, sorry, Wayne. I, I, I'm I'm happy to to move into complete discussion now. I mean, as I say, my reason for for, for presenting this was just to say, here's something I did on the side. Um, does it trigger any thoughts? Does it? <laughs> Clearly. I have one, and I, I just didn't want to get you out of sync with the rest of the, of the group. Oh, here, but I, 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 I this go. this this puts me in mind of, of George's classic swamping model, which is much simpler, but it kind of gets at some of the same things in some maybe a slightly more general way. This is sort of you could call it the unswamping model that you you want to move the intervention to where you. But but the idea of having to distribute resources somewhere, and the point that his model made, I think, at least for me, was you have to balance your approach. If you just put all of your resources at one point, one of these bottlenecks somewhere, then you end up just having the problem comes back around, bites you in the butt. So you have to understand how to do that. And, you know, he, you know, his genius was in that simple model was to probably had built lots of models like this of real systems. But he said, if I'm going to make get the message across, I have to boil it down. I just wondered if you thought at all about, could I boil this down? For teaching purposes or for getting the message across and and not lose you know the really interesting details that are associated with a more complex version yeah Wayne, remind us about the swamping model that's the social services in new york city where they they did this really thoughtful intervention and they swamped another part of the system and they ended up in a worse it wasn't you know worse before better it was better before worse and it was because of the nonlinearity in, in how the, the recidivism problem, you know, materialized itself. Okay. And I think this is exactly the same kind of a thing. If you don't do your a pretty thoughtful, uh, do you need it this complicated of a model to get at it? Maybe for sure, you mm -hmm. know, to actually, but, but anyway, that's what, what I think is so interesting here is, is how it connects with all kinds of other systems. I mean, we, we have the opportunity here to generalize and, and develop, if you want to think of it, uh, you know, archetypes that can be used in a much broader way, maybe. And that's what I like about it, is, is it has, seems to have that potential and it resonates in that way. But it, but it would be me nudging you in the simpler direction for publication. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, yes, I mean, I, I think having a mild, moderate, severe, extreme model with, with, with flows in both directions rather than breaking it down uh we would we, we'd also would also work um the, i i think that the thing that struck me was was that um how how often we're dealing with a problem without understanding the shape of it uh, and, and the dynamics of it um so is is the is the prevalence as a result of a small num a small amount of inc incidence and a lot of relapsing, or is it to do with a higher amount of incidence and uh, and and a longer episode and then a recovery? How many times do people go around this circle? And my my sense of it is possibly about four or five times in a lifetime uh, for 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 many, maybe one or two in, in, uh, once or twice for some, but but more 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 commonly four or five times and until possibly somebody's in their 50s or even their 60s and 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 then uh it it, it, it becomes less less of an issue but um, you pick it I, in the bud so to speak <laughs> yeah yeah and i i, I think if, i mean david again can 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 describe when when we discussed the model so 
one of the things I was interested in here, um, and I'm sure that Shreya must actually know more about this than I do, would be about when you've got a model like this that puts people into categories, what does it feel like for somebody who suffers from that condition to look at that model and, and think, are you, are you treating me as a number? How, how does that, but actually when we showed it to people who knew, who lived experience of anorexia, they almost universally liked it and, and, were, and it triggered conversations that were of use to, um, to clinicians and, and, and planners. But um, uh, David, would you like to say a bit about that process? Yeah, I, well, I, I, th I think it was quite interesting uh, showing this model to some carers and um, people have been using services. I mean, they, they interacted it. Wayne, I, I don't know if this is kind of partly what you're saying. They, they were asking quite simple questions. They were saying, well, why, why don't you treat us earlier? You know, why, why don't you use your inpatient capacity and get me in where my BMI is a little bit higher? What, why do I have to be so ill? Their, their kind of questions and commentary was, was very much at that level. Um, so, you know, I, I was very surprised actually about how well engaged, that they were engaged with, with something like this, which they were probably seeing for the first time. Um, but I was also interested, I, I like your idea of simplification uh, very much so, and I think that's, that's in essence something we need to be thinking about all the time. Because when we started to sort of look at strategy around adult eating disorder, dis, um, disorder uh, models of care and say, can we do this better? You know, we kind of knew quite a lot a bit about quite a lot about the capacities, about what we had in outpatients, what we had in the community, what we had in inpatients. We knew very little about unmet need. Um, to this day, you know, you take a population like South London that, that Douglas has briefly described, you know, probably a couple of hundred thousand people with eating disorders, but the capacity of the system is probably only dealing with a hundred. And what's going on? You know, where are these people? Are they, uh, what would happen if you improved sort of help seeking behavior for those people? Where would they come into the model? Uh, would they come in somewhere else that's not even on here? Bearing in mind, this is predominantly dealing with specialized care as opposed to um, sort of family, family sort of orientated guided self care or, or primary care through your GP your physician. So lots of it's it gets quite I said this to Eric and Douglas the other day prevalence becomes quite political because you, you start to have to make some some choices about intervention points and understand the impact of, of where they of where they are. Um, and that's where, you know, the the, the kind, of, kind of blood and guts of service users and carers saying what it's like and, and uh, the weights that they, the, the stuck bit's very interesting. You know, people would articulate this, say, well, I've been waiting two years to get seen. You know, I've, I've got somewhere in this model and, you know, I may be moderate, stuck. Um, and if you, because what's not on here is the kind of service model that sits on top of it and maybe drives some of those flows and intervenes on some of those stocks. Um, so we've got range of issues around what the services look like in terms of the intervention points here and what they look like outside of this model. If we, if we could actually identify people much, much earlier um, and start to work with their, um, not eating disorders, probably the wrong phrase for it, or it kind of uh, eating difficulties at that stage before they even cross over to the threshold, forget it, that warrants a, a clinical Kind of diagnostic code um so but it, these this applying the getting in rooms with clinicians getting in rooms with service users with this kind of model and, and commissioners people who've got money to spend but don't really know where their pivot points are to get the most bang for their buck this is the sort of thing that i think we should be doing a lot more of really um sorry douglas i don't know if that yeah just a just a quick question uh I wanted to check, was there any situation where some of the uh, individuals refuse the diagnosis that they don't think that they have any problem and they might not be willing to accept any intervention? Did you come across patients who were not really happy yeah. with their diagnosis? I, I think I think we would have been unlikely to come across people in, in that category because they 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 would need they would have needed to have had a, a history of being a patient before they were part of the group who, who we met. Okay. Okay. But, 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 but yes. not not in this not in our work here, John. But but plenty of people fit into that category, and a lot of them end up under the Mental Health Act being treated um, 
against their will in one sense. Um, but so they exist within the model, but we weren't working with them in this instance. Okay, thanks. Wayne, Wayne can I say at this point, I'm, I'm quite happy to stay on after the, the hour if anyone else wants to ask any questions. I appreciate that what happens on the hour is that many people have got other commitments and need to leave very quickly. Um, so I, I will hang around a little bit longer if anyone uh, wants to, to, to go to that. And perhaps there may be a question from somebody who's not yet um, uh, said anything. I, I will just say that I have moved the host over to Navid. I, I hope that he has a couple more minutes or I could move it to you or he could move yeah. it to you. I actually yeah. have to leave at in a couple of minutes because I have another meeting in another in a different room uh, that, that's, that, uh, that prevents me from staying on long this time, although I will generally not do that. It just worked out that way, this one meeting. Um, and and uh, that means Navid to be the person who would turn the recorder off. But one thing we could do is turn the recorder off pretty much now, I suppose. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and then yeah. switch over to much a little bit more informal mode for those who can stay. And it looks like Hassam yeah. has a, a comment or question. Yeah. Yes. I just wanted to ask about your categorizing of mental well-being into stock deteriorating and improving. It feels to me that improving and deteriorating are the kind of um, names we would choose for a for a flow variable rather than a stock variable, and and uh, like if so, so uh, on the on the x axis here we have four different states of body mass index, but but we could have uh, what, so my question is why didn't you approach the mental well being in the same status as in like a bad um, good or 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 you know better for example yeah. mental well being state. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a very valid question. And if if I if if we had been working on this with the 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 kind of experts that, that we would have needed, we probably would have come up with more uh, acceptable acceptable labels, if you like. So I think that's that, that's a good point. Um, uh, but uh, so, um, but I I think even in differentiating between people who are in, in a in a state of of moving towards recovery rather than moving towards uh, extreme weight loss, uh, then then uh, some somehow I mean so for example, you you could be at the extreme stage in terms of your BMI, but also improving because something has happened and, and your life is getting better, and and so. You're on you're on the journey in, in 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 that direction, whereas somebody else might be in the moderate state but still deteriorating and going in the journey in the opposite direction, which which is a which is a preferable state to be in. Dif difficult to say, but but the point is that it that, that it goes beyond just purely viewing it in terms of BMI. It's also it's also um, uh, it, 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 it's 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 not just the physical state of the condition. It's it it, 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 it is somebody's mental state. Which, um, but I, I agree that's the the, the the labeling is is perhaps slightly it, 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 in terms of describing a stock using a language that would suit a flow. I think that's okay. I, I think the stock yeah. means people in the mild state, and there are people in the mild state whose trajectory is is in the direction of deteriorating or in the direction of, of improving I, I think um but um if you can if you can think of uh, uh better nouns to use for, for these stocks then um <laughs> that no, I, I, thank you for the for the explanation no, I, I wasn't yeah. criticizing the choice by means. Normal. i just wanted to to ask about your justification yeah. behind it and uh, uh um, yeah so it's an interesting choice and um if, if it explains the phenomenon properly as long as it can be justified yes it's an interesting choice i'm sure that okay. if, if, I, i'm sure that if you're doing this with 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 um a, 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 an expert group of clinicians very quickly the labels would change i would i would hope for that Something so douglas else. if so if you are trying to populate this model with, let's say, uh, a survey data, mm -hmm. how difficult is it going to be in terms of categorizing individuals to the stocks? I think it'd be hugely difficult um, to, to have epidemiological data on, uh, I, I don't know what size of population sample you, you would need. It certainly, uh, it, 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 it's beyond the capacity of, of somebody who's who's working in, in consultancy that that's that's for sure uh, in fact I should be asking you that question John 
<laughs> well, you know, building on the comments of Hassam and John, I, uh, I, I was trying to think of another another angle altogether on the on the stocks, and one that would be supported by survey data. Um, another angle would be um, a behavioral one rather than a BMI one, where where behavioral um, uh, metrics are applied to put you into one class or another. And I'm mm -hmm. just very much reminded of the addiction um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, analogy here, where where people are can be abusers of drugs or addicted to drugs, and and there are behavioral markers that go along with uh, be, con being uh, considered an addict as opposed to an abuser, and and I you know and and so then loss of BMI might be considered a consequence of being in, in a yeah. behavioral, one behavioral stock or another. And then the clinical interventions could be about um, addressing behavioral yeah. symptoms. Yeah. And, and yeah. then you would find BMI that goes along, alongside. Yeah. And, and, and I'm sure actually that's that's what the clinical interventions are are, are mostly about. They, they are, um, uh, although actually at the extreme end, then I think some of the clinical interventions are very much about monitoring how much food people are eating and trying by whatever means to, to get them to eat, eat more. And, but and your description of four or five times during a lifetime, that there is all this work that's been done on addiction um, careers, they call them. Uh, yeah. You know, that is tracing individual uh, individuals through their addictive uh, uh, states and and also into remission and then relapse. It's it's very much the same language, and yeah. so it might be interesting to just think about it as a as an addiction. Hi, um, I was just curious to know, like, where on these stocks and flows would the services usually map on, and whether you like have any idea of at what stock do like clinicians tend to intervene and at what stock do they stop? So just to get a sense of threshold yeah. that they think of, uh, which is considered improvement for them. So I, I think that, that, that uh, <clears throat> in terms of people who become inpatients, they would be exclusively at the extreme end. And I think people who become outpatients would be in the severe to extreme end, possibly some moderate. And I think that people in, in the mild and moderate conditions would be in would be treated in primary care. Is uh, that's my, uh, I don't know why I'm saying this when I've got David in the room. No, that, yeah. that's yeah, that's that's about right. I think um, Douglas, where you've mm -hmm. described it there. Mm -hmm. Do do they also look at the mental well-being aspect of it so would patients yeah. continue to be in that till they reach the improving stage or not necessarily i think there's a range of things so for example um there are there are um there's more of a kind of self-help thing for people who are recovering and have achieved a certain uh, you know, BMI or level level of stability. So, yeah. so for, for people with a with a with a history, then there there are um, organisations that that they can go to. Um, but the as the as the House of Commons report makes clear, then then because of it was saying that because of the lack of data, then then services for these people are, are disadvantaged because money goes to services where people have been counted better. So so there's there's very clearly a, a nod towards that that we're not uh, we're not providing enough for this population, or not least because we don't know enough about what's what's happening. Um, uh, so. Um, Sorry, I, I don't know if that answers your question, Shreya, about that. Um, no, that's helpful. I, I just wonder whether like people would find this useful from that angle, just to understand like at what point mm -hmm. uh, do they actually stop intervening and what it means actually in terms of the prevalence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think the known prevalence is obviously much more at, this, this, at, at the severe and extreme end. And the unknown prevalence is more clearly at the mild and moderate. 
end, but just what would these mild and moderate figures need to be in order to make sense of, of what's happening and, and, and also what, what capacity would it take um, to provide uh, services for people in, in the mild and moderate states where there, there may be a great reluctance on the part of the of the sufferer actually to acknowledge that there is a problem. So, um, I, I, which again fits partly with uh, with Jack's characterization um, uh, or, or, or saying it's similar to to, to certain kinds of addictions. Um, but I, I think probably um, I, I don't think that that this is not what Jack was saying, by the way. But 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 you sometimes feel that. With some addictions, um, the, the user story is to say that they really needed to hit rock bottom before they could turn things around. And I, I don't think that that needs to be the case with, with anorexia. Um, uh, but I think that because of the lack of service capacity, users experience the services as if that's what the, they're being told. You, you, need to get, you need to get worse before we'll pay attention to you. Um, I, don't, I don't know that that means perversely that people try to get they could get worse so that they can get help. I, uh, I couldn't really speculate on, on, on that, but, but, but there is this feedback loop, if you like, between a lack of capacity and the messages that service users get and their understanding of what, what the services are trying to do. Can so I just, just make a comment that might help Douglas, please? Mm. It, it just that I, I think the value of a model like this is, simply to give one possible way in which you can link together some very intangible things that people talk about. And the professionals here will talk about deteriorating and they will talk about mild, moderate and severe, but without having much of a mental model about how it links together. Mm. And I think you, you just need a starting point with people to say, well, this is one configuration that may or may not represent your mental model. And interestingly, I, I think this is often where the model that brings quite a lot to the table to actually say, well, here are some possible structures. And those structures indicate some very systemic ideas like intervention at the early end is helpful. And also to categorize who's in influencing what. It's easy to say who's working and influencing the severe end, but the nebulous end is this mild part where I don't think people have any flow structure in their heads as to what's going on there. And it's only influenced by individual families and individuals recognizing that they're not quite normal in their e eating habits. So just the very fact of putting it together, um, I, I think is very valuable. I don't want to prolong this meeting unnecessarily. So maybe, maybe there's time for two more questions, maybe before we uh, finish. Or maybe maybe all the questions have been answered. Just one of the dynamics in there, Douglas, and it comes to this, I don't know whether I'm a bit sort of going down a rabbit hole here about the relationship between the eating disorder and mental well-being. Is there seems to there's often in the in the model like this, particularly at the, the severe end, there's the bind, there's the issue about refeeding, and then there's the issue about therapeutic intervention. And and the system tends to say, we have to refeed you to get to a point to when we can now intervene therapeutically. So that kind of relationship along the top there, you know, about yeah. sort of yeah. moving your BMI in the right direction, then relates to intervening with kind of um, evidence-based kind of clinical models, therapeutic models that then start to get under the skin of um, the, the, the clinical presentation other than the feeding presentation, the eating presentation, if you like. And somewhere in here is a relationship between all of, the, of those things. And it's, it's complex. And there is, I think, a, a sort of almost that addictive dynamic in it as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, that addictive type behavior, that control behavior that comes in with it within the eating disorder. 
kind of presentation. So I think that's all, all quite interesting as well. But I still think there's the bigger there is that big issue, and just just we are seeing it now right in the middle of our, um, COVID, huge growth in eating disorders amongst young people, or or disordered eating as some people are calling it these days, or eating difficulties. The the numbers are going through the roof in terms of um, uh, help seeking, but that help seeking tends to be in the charitable sector rather than, you know, it doesn't that which doesn't exist on on this model here, but may influence the, the rates at which people turn up or don't turn up. Yeah. One last question, if you want. Uh... Well, well, Douglas, it's just that what, what David said reminded me of this. Um, a d dilemma around the treatment of eating disorders that I recall, um, which, which is that refeeding, uh, uh, if taken too far, can actually exacerbate the psychological problem. Mm. Uh, and, you know, for example, the idea of being on appetite um, enhancers can a distort body image uh, uh, to, the, to, to cause an exacerbation of, of the psychological problem at the root of it. And that in some cases you may actually want to move to appetite suppressants just to tamp down the cycle. You know, so so there's there is a sort of a, 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 a tug of war between the psychological and the um, uh, you know you know the, the the body aspect of the the biological aspect of what's going on that is worth modeling. Mm. Yeah. Well. I'd just like to say thank you everyone for staying on a little bit longer uh, and uh, continuing the, the conversation. So um, I, I put, I, I did, uh, well, if you, if, you, if you look over the recording, actually, actually, what I will do for anyone who wants to stay in the room a few seconds longer is I can put the, uh, the reference to the, the model on this IC exchange. I'll put it in the chat so you can link to it <laughs> if you've got nothing else to do this evening. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to meeting again very soon. So, uh, so if you want to stick around until I add that to the chat, you're very welcome. Uh, if I won't take offence if you leave at this point without uh, without seeing it. So there you go. Uh, just a minute, I'm just copying it now. And thanks very much, Douglas and David and Eric. There you go. Thanks. So, so the, the the links now in the chat. So you, so there you go. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you well, very much. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll see you next month. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.